Hello, Chef AJ. Welcome to the Well Vegan Travel Podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am so excited to have you on the podcast because I have followed your work and known about you pretty much since I became vegan, like 13 years ago for a really long time. So I've really watched what you've been doing. But for those people that are not familiar, would you mind sharing a little bit about what it is that you do in the vegan space? No, not at all. It'd be my pleasure. So I am a 45 year veteran of veganism. I'm what they call the OG. So became vegan the minute I left home at the age of 17. I still remember my vegan anniversary, September 1st, 1977. I work as, I don't work as a chef in a restaurant anymore. I did that for many years. I was a vegan executive pastry chef in a Los Angeles restaurant, but I still do many culinary uh, classes where I live and for many of the wonderful plant-based doctors like Dr. McDougall and Dr. Rosen Alviera. They'll, now it's everything Zoom, but I will teach culinary classes for them. I also write books. I've written, gosh, three or four by now. And one of the things that I really love doing that I only started doing since the pandemic because of the pandemic is I host a daily live show. It is a YouTube show called Chef AJ Live, but it also streams on Twitter and Facebook. And I've done over a thousand of these since the pandemic began every day at 11 a.m. Pacific. And I have wonderful guests on every day, ranging from plant-based doctors to plant-based athletes, plant-based chefs. and it's just a wonderful uh, experience for me to bring this information to the masses. Fantastic. And you adhere to a particular vegan diet. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because that really does play into what we're going to be right. talking uh, about it, today. It will make more sense what we're going to talk about. But, but, but before, I'm happy to answer any questions about my diet. But people need to know the reason for it. It's not some just random, like, I'm trying to be difficult to every restaurant owner or, or host. It is because I was obese for most of my life until my early 50s. Even as a vegan, I was a very unhealthy person as a vegan. And while I think veganism is the most wonderful thing you can do for the planet, for the animals, it is not always healthy if you do it the way I did it, which was a, a junk food vegan diet. I went vegan strictly for the animals when I was 17 years old and I knew nothing about health. There was no internet. If, if Neil Barnard was doing his work then. I hadn't heard of him or PCRM. And so basically I ate a very unhealthy diet full of sugar, fat, and salt, just junk food. Just because something's vegan doesn't mean it's healthy. Oreos are vegan. The Coke Slurpees that I were having every day for breakfast was vegan. Dr. Pepper that I was drinking every day for lunch was vegan. But having a junk food vegan diet for 26 years not only got me to close to 200 pounds at five feet, five inches tall, but it also gave me the beginning of colon cancer. And because of having been so fat and so sick for so long and not wanting to have surgery or drugs or die, I went on a more strict version of a, and I don't like the word plant-based. I hate the word plant-based because that doesn't mean anything to me because plant-based, you could be 51% plants and 49% animal products or processed food. So I was already vegan, but a plant-exclusive diet of whole foods as they were found in nature, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, without the addition of any of the chemicals or processed foods that are normally added to food like sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, or salt. I call it sofas free, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt. Other doctors like Dr. L. Goldhammer will call it SOS free, sugar, oil, salt. But I found when I did that, people were still giving me flour and alcohol as if it were healthy. So I, that is the diet I follow, no caffeine as well, but generally caffeine is in beverages, not in foods. You don't, you don't have to really, eat, I guess, unless it had chocolate in it. So I do that for my health. I'm vegan for the animals, but I eat this specific way for my health because I truthfully don't want to go back to being 200 pounds, nor do I want to have a reoccurrence of my precancerous polyps that I had from eating a junk food vegan diet. So that is why I do it. I always tell people do the least restrictive diet that you can do that will get you the results you seek. But for me, with my genetics and family history, a more liberal vegan diet just did not work for me in terms of having a not overweight body or having optimal health. Thank you so much for explaining that. It's really interesting because we have quite a few inquiries to our website and that people are interested in coming on a tour with us. And quite often, I would say on a weekly basis, we get an email from somebody who they usually mention no oil and it depends. 
if we can accommodate them or not, it's often very hard to because the hotels or the restaurants aren't able to. It means they have to create something completely different and it's certainly not going to be as gourmet, let's say, as the oil version. So sadly, we often have to say to these people, I'm really sorry this isn't going to be a good fit for you right now. Maybe in the future we'll have some no oil or more healthier tours out there. But for now, it's a little bit too hard. And is that your experience too with traveling? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I wrote in my book, The Secret Self and My Weight Loss, a whole chapter called How to Eat Healthfully Anywhere. I probably should have said almost anywhere because I'm sure there's going to be exceptions. But for me, I traveled professionally for my job, speaking at medical conferences, cruise ships, spas, mostly in the United States, but a few internationally for over 10 years. And this was more than, this was not in the last two years, obviously, since COVID. And I realized that the world is not set up for people that want to eat vegan in general, or especially that want to eat healthy in particular. And it has to do with a lot of things, but the, but the reality is sugar, fat, and salt, that's what sells. There's an old saying, in the food industry, no salt, no sale. And so the amount of people in the world that really eat this way are probably so minuscule, even compared to the number of people that eat vegan. And because there's not a demand for it, it's not going to be offered. But even if there were a demand for it, you have to understand I'm a culinary school graduate. There is no culinary school out there teaching tomorrow's chefs how to cook vegan for one and how to cook without oil or sugar or salt. It's just mm -hmm. not because people that go, people that like to go to restaurants that like to eat hyper palatable food, they're not doing that for a health experience. They're doing it for, for the pleasure of eating this, this kind of hyper palatable gourmet food. And that's fine. It's just that people that have medical conditions, especially people that are struggling with their weight or food addictions, these are not interactions that are, are favorable for them. I mean, again, everybody can choose what they want to do, but if you've struggled with your weight and with food addiction, or even with heart disease and diabetes, where one-off planned meal, somebody with really unretractable high blood pressure, one restaurant meal, because restaurants use more sugar, fat, and salt than, listen, I worked in one, than you ever would in home, okay? That can be very detrimental to their health. And this is not everyone, but for the people for whom this matters, this information may be important. And so that, for me, I'm not going to risk my food sobriety, meaning my recovery from food addiction, because for one cheat or off-plan meal, for me, it's just not worth it because I've fought too hard too long to get to this level of health and weight that I'm not going to compromise it. And for some people, that would create a lot of dissonance, fear of missing out. But to me, the only thing I miss out on is heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. Yeah, there's, it's not, a, not such a difficult choice. Yeah, but a lot of people do. I get it. People love it. There are places, I, I can't speak for the whole you know, world because most of my travel was in the United States, but it's getting better in the United States because restaurants are, or at least some restaurants are starting to understand that because I've trained chefs in, in restaurants, at least I did when I lived in LA. And while at first they're like, you can't cook without oil, like when you teach them how to do it, they are thrilled because you have to understand that oil costs money to a restaurant and chefs have a budget. And when they learn that like, my God, this is not, that, that you don't need it. That the, th the funny thing is, is food can taste not only as good without oil, but it actually can taste better because what people don't realize is oil actually coats the taste buds of one's tongue. And when there's oil in food, you have to then put a lot more salt in it to taste the food. And we like sugar, fat, and salt because it's addictive. These are chemicals that don't exist in nature, at least not in the form they're being used in restaurants. And what happens is they stimulate the production of dopamine in the brain, which is this feel good neurotransmitter. And that's why we like them so much. But I have done cooking demonstrations. For example, making a soup, like I have a black bean soup recipe where there's no oil. And I've done side by side demonstrations where I've done the same thing and people were like watching me and I put in the oil or step, sauteing the onion and four tablespoons of olive oil. And then we would do blind taste tests and then people would either say, I can take detect no difference or they, they would pick the not oil one as the one that tasted better. It's just, it's the way chefs are taught. It's the way people are taught. And I'm not against people eating fat, by the way, but I'd rather have people eat it in its whole food form. Eat the olives, not the olive oil, eat the, Eat the nuts, not the not the almond oil, not the avocado oil. Eat the food whole. But again, the restaurant industry is not the health industry. 
so th it's not this is not important to them i think for the most part because that's not who their customers are but i think if somebody would actually step out and do this because there is a cruise ship that will do this then the national health association works with a cruise ship where they train the chefs sos re they will see that maybe it's not the biggest piece of the market but there is enough interest if they would do it that people would travel more i think if they knew they could get the food that they're used to Yes, another one of my associates, a friend, her name is Kim Giovacco from Veg Jumps and Journeys. And she started this year No Oil Tours based in the United States. And all of the travelers get together in a nice place, in a nice small hotel or something like that. She brings in a chef, and this chef cooks for everybody that goes there and they go out and do sightseeing excursions get together and it's really lovely and she's doing really well with it i'm very happy for her that sounds yes. fabulous <laughs> all right we both know that there are people who really need to eat this way for many really important reasons but sometimes people do have to travel whether it's for work or to see family or whether it's staying in a hotel or whether it's staying with a friend or family members and you mentioned that you wrote a chapter on your book about yeah. eating this way when traveling so do you have I, any tips to share? i have lots of tips but also i want to say that depending on a person's personality this may be more difficult or less difficult because the, a lot of people, the least people I work with that struggle with excess weight and food addictions, they're largely female and they're largely very agreeable. They're people pleasers. And if you're a people pleaser, it's going to be a lot harder to ask for what you want in any situation. So that being said, if you are somebody that is able to do that, you have to understand that if you want to keep your diet while you're away, you have to be like your own you're in charge in other words like you can never expect a host whether it's somebody personally or a restaurant to accommodate you and so there's a few things that i recommend and again i'm speaking to mostly travel in the united states the only countries i can speak to obviously are the ones that i've been at which are japan mexico where i go often for work and the caribbean however what i'm teaching you could possibly be done everywhere, but you would have to check the websites like tsa.gov because there are certain rules with food, especially produce. Different countries have different rules. So for example, like if I'm like if I'm flying to Hawaii, it's in the United States, but it's part of the United States. It's not in the mainland. Like I could bring food, but if I'm flying home from Hawaii, I can't bring the potatoes with me, those wonderful potatoes they have. Now, if they're cooked, I can. So that's why it's really important, I think, for everyone to do their homework if they are trying to bring food into a country, the, like I said, the United States, with the exception of Hawaii, it's not a problem in the continental United States. But I think it's important to go to websites like tsa.gov and really find out what the rules are for those countries. Because the worst that happens, it's not like they'll arrest you, they'll take your food away. If they find it, and you, you know, that's, and if, if, like for me, if you take my sweet potato away, I'm gonna die. No, I'm not gonna die, but you know what I'm saying. So that's one thing I would recommend. But I have become a master at, at travel within the United States just by taking food with me, the kind of food I eat. And it's so funny because I remember one time I was going through TSA and the agent, a lot of times uh, you have these ice chips to keep your, your food cold, at least for on the plane. And they're completely allowed as long as they're frozen solid. And, but sometimes for whatever reason, it triggers the machine. So they pull you aside and they go through your bag. And so they, they were going through my bag and the set, the guy said, oh, are you taking all your food for the week? And I said, no, sir, this is for the day. <laughs> and I, it cracked me up because I think he has no idea that when you're on more of a, a calorically diluted, whole food, plant-based, low fat diet, like how much you need to eat. But the point is, so that's very easy. As long as you have a frozen ice chip, if, if, if the food requires refrigeration, there's lots of things that don't. But another thing that's really great to keep your food cold, well, you travel and this is good for anywhere is the food that you're going to want to eat so for example i do batch cooking so i have a lot of entrees in my freezer that are already frozen that could be my ice chip i don't need a de enough another ice chip that entree can be my ice chip frozen bags of fruits and vegetables those can be what's keeping my food cold however you want to think about food that doesn't require an ice chip because TSA could decide this is a little bit too melted. They could take your ice chip away. That's why I always buy them at the 99 cent store because I don't want to buy an expensive one and have it get taken away. So I never try to rely on refrigerated food, always food that doesn't require refrigeration. And I actually had a client once that had lost a hundred pounds and she was going on a trip to Morocco and all she could bring was a backpack. 
And we had to figure out like, oh, what, she's like on these camels, like what can she bring that's compliant? And, and there, there are things you could bring. So generally, like for instance, dried grains, that's not a problem going to any country. So oats, for example, you just need to have your calories. You need to have some starch. So having bags, little Ziploc bags of rolled oats, because with rolled oats, unlike steel cut and the oat groat, you can eat those like dry yeah, with a splash of maybe water, juice, or almond milk. But what I'm saying is they don't require cooking. And so one of the things that saved me many times was to have little baggies of what I call overnight oats, where each little baggie would have a half a cup of oats. I would put in a little bit of vanilla powder, a little bit of cinnamon, some chia seeds, and maybe some dried currants. And that would save me for when I couldn't find food because you usually can find an apple somewhere, a banana somewhere, hopefully, and you can add that to that. So that's just one trick. And also little bags of oats, they take up almost no room. They have, they, they don't weigh anything practically. So even on this backpacking trip for her, that was a much better choice than trying to have her bring cans of beans or things like that. Beans, by the way, what's cool now is they have beans, regular and salt free, not just in cans because cans require a can opener, but in these aseptic cart cartons now where all you have to do is tear off the top. And so those are good things to have because beans just beans are satiating and they're high in protein. So if you get to a situation like, oh my God, the only thing they have is a dry salad, guess what? Dump those beans on there. So they'll, they'll, those are tricks I learned. In the United States, what some people do, and again, it depends. Obviously, if you're if you have an emergency situation, you're going to somebody's funeral. It's a lot different than when you know in advance what you're going to do. And so what I recommend to people is, if at all possible, find a place where you can do your own cooking. Airbnbs, for example, you know, like rental homes, and then that could, that's what. That makes it very pleasant because if you're in charge of your food, you're going to be able to get it the way you want. So I used to travel with my Instant Pot electric pressure cooker. It comes in a small enough size, a three quart size that fits in a bag easily underneath the seat on the airplane or in the overhead. And then when I would get to my destination, and again, I was doing this before Lyft and Uber. It's so much easier now, at least in the United States, because before it was like, ugh, just so hard to go get my food. But now I used, I, I could get to wherever I am get a Lyft or an Uber, take me to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's, stock up because most places have a fridge. And I'm gonna tell you a little funny fridge story in a second. And then I can get my food. And a Whole Foods is, is not a place I normally shop because I don't have one near me. But if I'm in a big city, they can be a real godsend because not only do they have one of the most exceptional salad bars in the world, but everything that I'm talking about from oats to beans, things like that are available there. Rice is another great thing. Even at Costco, they sell rice that's already cooked in a quinoa too in these little packages, which I guess if you had to, you could eat them cold, but you could easily microwave. So those kind of things, because I'm looking for calories when I travel. I'm looking for calories from starch that are, are, are going to keep me full because I know that for the most part, I, either at a store I, or somewhere I can get fruits and vegetables, but I need my starch. My favorite starch is potatoes and sweet potatoes. And what was great about always having an Instant Pot with me is I can cook, in, not in the cruise ship. They, I wasn't allowed to bring it there, but almost every place, even if it's international, there's plug converters. I was able to cook, you know, and cook my cook rice. I could cook sweet potatoes, cook potatoes, those kind of things. So that saved me. Having a refrigerator can be enormously helpful, whether you are cooking your own food or not when you're away. And I can tell you a funny story about a refrigerator that I didn't say this in my book, but it is funny. So ever since I was in, well, I was vegan since I'm 17. And in 1977, there weren't a lot of vegan restaurants or any vegan options. And I knew back then that I, I had to bring food with me if I wanted to eat sometimes. And I never saw it as though this is so inconvenient because we were raised kosher and we pretty much had to always bring our food because the world wasn't set up for kosher people in the 60s and we weren't gonna eat non-kosher food. So we just got used to it and I got used to it. Well, I used to go to Las Vegas a lot in my early 20s as soon as I Got gamble, not that I was a gambler. But you could go for twenty nine dollars for a weekend. It was like just friend, my friend Elaine and I would get in the car, drive for four hours, twenty nine dollars to stay at the Flamingo Hilton, three days and two nights, and that's a cheap vacation when you're twenty two and you just want to do something. And so there wasn't really vegan food there, at least that, uh, that I could eat. And I wasn't a healthy vegan then; I was just a vegan. And so I would bring food with me, and some of it needed refrigeration. And I remember asking for, now it's more common, I think, for most hotels, even motels, to have a refrigerator for the most part. And I, I asked for a refrigerator 
And they said they didn't have any. And so again, trying to get people to lie, but I did tell a white lie. And I said, I'm on a medication that needs refrigeration. And I take it four times a day. So will you store it for me? And I'll come down four times a day to get it. And then like within 10 minutes, a refrigerator was magically delivered to my room. So this was like in, in the early eighties. And so I, I knew that they had them. It's just that at that time they, they didn't routinely put them in everybody's room. Fast forward almost 40 years later, and I'm back in Vegas and I have taught other people to eat this way. We were all at a conference together. So of course everybody wants a refrigerator now. So I get to the hotel and there's no refrigerator. And so I call up and because my friend who had checked in earlier got one, so I knew they had them. And they said, sorry, we don't have, we're out or whatever. And I said, oh, that's okay. I'm on a medication. I take it four times a day for me and I'll come down. And then within a few minutes, they delivered something that I'm not kidding was about the size, I don't know, of like, how can I explain this? It was really, it, it wasn't, it was a refrigerator for medication. It was basically like the size of an envelope or, and it wasn't <laughs> that you could use just for medication. So somebody has been talking about what I'm doing and now they, the hotels have gotten smart and they're not giving full size of future figures to everybody. <laughs> That is hilarious. Yeah, I, I definitely have talked about needing needing little blue bricks like f for your cool bag, getting them frozen. If there's no refrigerator or no freezer, I go to the hotel and reception. I say, oh, could, would you mind freezing this for me? I have medication. Yeah, I will admit I've told similar white lies, but that's so funny that, that the whole hotel ran out of refrigerators. Worst case scenario, again, I can't speak to every, I've never been, I haven't been to every hotel in every part of the world, but for the most part, even like lower cost motels have ice machines usually. And so what, what I've done when I've absolutely couldn't get a refrigerator and I had something perishable or something I would have preferred, it's not even so much that the food is perishable. There's just certain things you enjoy more cold. For example, they sell boxes of, of plant milk, really tiny that are like one cup serving, which is perfect because if you don't have a refrigerator, you don't want to keep or, or opening a quart and then then having it go bad. So these little boxes, they come, they sell them in fours usually are, are perfect for that. Now you could have that at room temperature, but it's just more enjoyable cold. So if I couldn't get a refrigerator and I wanted something cold, I would just get ice buckets. You could fill your mm. whole bathtub if you wanted. So that's one way to mm. also help keep things cold. But that that's just one thing I do is I try to always, when possible, get, get a situation where I can cook an Airbnb. And if it is a hotel, I just bring what I can. Now, since I started uh, writing about this, it, there, there are companies now, it's interesting that exist now that didn't exist when I was at the height of my travel, like Mama Says, for example. And what Mama Says is, is it's a whole food plant-based, no oil, and then you can get a version without sugar and salt food delivery company. It's fresh food that is delivered refrigerated. It's actually quite delicious. And so what, what some of my clients do, especially those for whom one meal off, one meal off plan is not a big deal to most people, but people, like I said, with certain conditions mm -hmm. or even people that are severely food addicted, they get, they, they have such a hard time getting back on track. And so they'll, what they'll do is they will order mama says and have it shipped to their destination and they'll have brilliant eat. So that can help people too, especially because if you're on vacation, like you don't want to cook, you really don't have to, you get mama says, and you can supplement of course, with some fresh fruits and vegetables, but I've known people to do that. And they've been very happy with that. The other thing I do is I bring things that don't go bad. So in other words, while I tend not to eat a lot of dry dehydrated food because it's missing the water. When I'm traveling, that is when I bring everything like that. So bananas, for example, bananas are a great source of delicious mm -hmm. calories when you need them. And, but bananas can get really mushy, even on an airplane. It's something happens to bananas when you get up in the air, like they just go, they're not great. And so I get dried bananas, that's the company Barnana. They come in all different flavors, like peanut butter and chocolate. I just get the regular ones. And those have, they keep my belly full and they're delicious. So I'll travel with things like beet chips and carrot chips. You can get brands without oil and salt at places like Sprouts and on Amazon. So those are great for travel as well. Uh, there's companies like Dr. McDougall's Right Foods that make cup of noodle type soups. Too much sodium for me, but for some people, that's a good option to have those kind of things. Or like I said, even soups with aseptic packages where you tear the top off, those can be good choices. I, because I'm a chef and because I've always, not always, but many years have used a food dehydrator, 
I can make things that I can bring. So I make different types of granola type cereals where crunchy little snacks that aren't going to go bad. So I'll bring a lot of those types of things with me. And again, th those are great because they don't take up much room in a suitcase or a backpack or even a fanny pack. And I love dehydrated snacks for this type of experience because they're not perishable. So mm -hmm. that's the other thing to think about, even if it's hot and things like that. So again, it's not the most glamorous answer that most people want to hear because again, people want to enjoy their vacation. But again, if you're one of those people like me where you just, it's just not worth it to go off plan, there's strategies. Oh, let me tell you another story. You you really have to call an, ahead too and ask. It's always better to just call ahead and, and in any kind of situation, whether it's just to inquire if they have a blow dryer or a refrigerator, the more information you can g gain in advance, the better. But one of the things is often learn to navigate restaurant or hotel menus. And again, there's phones and there's internet, so you can ask before you get there if, if you can be accommodated. And I find that it's much better if you have a special diet, whether you're going to a wedding or a bar mitzvah or a restaurant or some kind of tour, to ask in advance because you can't expect somebody to just drop everything and make the food the way you want it. If you ask them in advance, they still may say no, but if you wait till the minute you get there, it's gonna be much more mm -hmm. difficult to do your request. And so the thing is, if they can accommodate you, I would think generally they would, but it depends on the size of your your group, for example. So like on a cruise ship, they can't make something for one person the way they could if you're on some kind of expensive kind of tour with you know 10 people in your tour group or you've talked to them in advance. You, there are some cruises, lines that are extremely accommodating to, to special diets, but that's why you need to have this conversation before you sail with your travel agent if you're using one or the line because different some cruise ships are they will bend over backwards for you and some will just say look we can't accommodate you i know this because i've been a speaker many times on the holistic holiday at sea and they do a great job of providing no oil for people but they just can't do no salt it's not possible because they're cooking these huge they're cooking for thousands of people and the, the is, so just ask in advance and like I said, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. If you do ask, there's a good chance they may help you. But there's usually things that you can get within your diet. They're not going to be, like you say, the most glamorous. You're not going to, don't expect like a lasagna and a, and a chocolate cake if you're on a very special diet. But if you are willing to eat more simply, which is how I eat even when I'm not traveling, you're usually going to do okay. But if you're somebody that's a real foodie, the way I'm proposing is going to probably be like a punishment to you. <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'd love to talk a little bit about the dehydration of foods as well, if you don't mind, because I've been starting to follow this, these Instagram people, they're called through hikers, through T-H-R-U hikers. And I don't think they're vegan, but they do these incredible hikes, like from Canada to Mexico, like 2,000 miles, 3,000 wow. miles, that kind of thing at one time. Sure. And they create very interesting content and they prepare all their food in advance with dehydrators and they pack it all up. And I actually think it probably would be so fast compliant when I think about it. And they create this content where they, you know, create, they dehydrate huge amounts of onions and beans and salsas and things like that. And then they create other, and they, they yeah. dehydrate it and then they break it all and they put them in little baggies and then they, they have to mail these. Yeah. yeah, they have to mail these boxes to different places, like in week long intervals along the trail. And then they go off the trail and they go into the town and then they pick up their box and that's their food for the week. And it's really interesting. It's brilliant. It's, brilliant. it's yeah, amazing. I mean, is it dehydrated or is it freeze dried? Because there's two different mechanisms by which you can do food. Definitely dehydrated. Definitely that's dehydrated. Dehydrators mm. are fairly affordable for most people. Freeze drying is that that machine is a lot more expensive, but that works at wet as well. And like you said, you're giving me all these ideas. You know, I haven't traveled since the pandemic, so we're talking three years now. But you you are reminding me of some wonderful things that I used to teach people. So, for example, hummus. Hummus is something that when you go through TSA, it's to the discretion of the agent. Sometimes they think it's liquid and they take it. Sometimes they let it go in. 
If it's on a wrap, sometimes they'll let it go in. If it's in a little container, they won't. But you can actually buy hummus or make your own, your preference, and dehydrate it. And then when you get to your destination, rehydrate it. So brilliant. I'm, I, thank you for saying that because I forgot that is something that people can do. And like you said, the same thing with soups and stews. Then you just, because most places, even lower cost motels will have that little coffee pot where you can boil water so you can get it again for people for, for the, you know that for this is travel is a way of life and restaurant eating they look at me like you are and you're crazy however for the people that eat like me they're like oh thank goodness there are some things that we can do and yeah uh, we, we had an inquiry for one of our France trips a little while ago. He wasn't able to come in the end, but he, his, he wanted to come with his family and he wanted to go to France. He really wanted to have a sightseeing experience of France. And we talked about it and I said, look, we're probably going to be able to accommodate no oil. It's, it's not going to be French food. It's not going to be so fast versions of the food that everybody else is eating. It's going to be very basic but healthy and good in calories and enough food for you and he was like it's okay I, I just want to experience France and I, I think very often we put food on this pedestal that is the be-all and end-all we put it before people it's sort of like when you go to a wedding or a bar mitzvah I guess people get married more than once but generally you don't have more than one bar mitzvah you're not going for some if you are that's pretty sad and so who cares it's you're right people are more important than food and but for some people, food is elevated to the level of the the most important thing to them. But then again, it comes down to do you eat to live or live to eat. And again, I, I, I see a different part of the population. I see people whose lives have been lost and health has been compromised and limbs have been lost because of the way they eat. And so I don't give food that power. And the other thing is once you start to learn to manage your food addictions, this quote, plain, boring way of eating, it's actually quite delicious. So I love my, you, you might look at my meals like, oh my God, she eats sweet potatoes and broccoli every day. My sweet potatoes are the Hannah yams or the Japanese and they're roasted and then they're air fried and they have some California balsamic vinegar on them. And, and to me, my food is just as delicious, but that's because my taste buds have neuroadapted. Oh, but that's the other thing, California balsamic or some kind of dressing. Most places you can get a salad is can be so boring when it's a dry salad. However, uh, California Balsamic, in addition to making their large glass bottles, sells travel bottles that are plastic in three ounce sizes. That is the exact size that TSA allows. So you could even get like a, a Ziploc bag in a gallon size and put like 10 of those in there. That's, I'm so thankful that those bottles exist because they won't take them away, even a full three ounce bottle. So having a delicious sauce like that, like a California Balsamic in teriyaki, if all I can get in veggies, now it, it elevates it. So that's the thing. And generally, like for me, I, when I do travel, I'm not going, you know, for, I know a lot of people do go for the food, but that's not my purpose in travel. And also I'm a chef and it's like, I don't mean to be snobby, but my food tastes better to me than somebody else's. I, well, you know what you need to do as a vegan travel agency from, and again, we never really got to the root of why Chef AJ does not like to travel. And probably the main reason is because I love my dogs and I don't want to be without her. And we need to find some travel agencies that were like like dog friendly because then I would go because I miss her so much that I, it's it's just not worth it for whatever experience I could have. Their lives are so short. That's, and she's a member of the family. And it's, I do, I stuff that I never go away. I get this wonderful job for eight days quite often teaching at the, the number one spa in the world, Rancho La Puerta and she can't come and I get that, but it's like, why would I then want to leave her on purpose? So I don't know how other people feel about leaving their pets at home, but I don't like to do that. Yeah, I will tell you that, that you know, I've just came back from six weeks nearly and leaving my cats, which was very difficult. I'm very lucky. I have my mother-in-law that lives in the building and she comes and spends like three or four hours a day with my cats and gives them lots of attention. So that's good. But of course, missing our animals is really difficult. There are some really great options like trustedhousesitters.com is a really great way of finding someone really good actually to to look after your animals and they'll send pictures every day and let you know if everything's all right. I know it's not the same as being in the same room as your companion animal, but it's not bad if you do want to. So you've talked a lot about what we can do when we're actually at our destination, um, going to Airbnbs and, and, and fridges and the hotel rooms or these kinds of things. But what about if you 
maybe aren't completely prepared and you are at an airport and you need to get some food, maybe for on the plane as well. That's a great question. So there's a couple different ways that I can answer that. First of all, I used to work at the True North Health Center where people would fast on water for 40 days for health conditions. And so if somebody can fast on water for 40 days, it's very likely that you could go six or eight hours without food if you can't get it. I'm never saying go without water. So that's number one. And truthfully, if you're somebody that's prone like me to jet lag, when you don't eat during air travel, it's actually much better for you. So that's one. Number two, what's really cool now is most people have the internet. Obviously you must, if you're listening to this and you can actually find out what every airport has to offer before you get there. And I believe that PCRM even still has an app that helps you do that, but you can always just use good old Google. And I remember, I'm so old that when I used to travel when I was younger, you there was actually a, something somebody called a travel agent. Like you couldn't go anywhere without, her name, my mind was named Etta, and I'd say, I need to go to Philadelphia, and then she would do it for me. Now we make, most of us make our own reservations, at least when we're traveling within the United States. And pretty much gone is the nonstop flight. It's very few nonstop flights anymore. And almost every flight within the United States requires a connection. And what's cool is you can pick your connecting airport based on which airport is going to have the best food for you. And I know this because I gotta tell you, have somebody who traveled almost every week for over 11 years, I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times I was delayed in airports, sometimes up to 24 hours. That's why I always say, if it's all possible, take 24 hours worth of food for you. So knowing that this is a real situation, I always chose my airport based on the food at that airport. So a lot of times, certain certain cities like Chicago has two well-known airports, Midway and O'Hare. Texas has three airports. And a lot of times you can get your choice of which one, right? So a lot of people say, oh, I'll pick O'Hare. It's a better airport, you more connections. Uh -uh, not me. I always pick Midway. Why? because they had a salad bar restaurant that was open till eight o'clock. And I'll tell you, mm. the last time I was there and I was delayed and my plane didn't take off till 2 a.m., that was a good thing that I made that choice. So I also choose my connecting airport also based on if I know people. So a lot of times, like, give me a choice of, do I want Phoenix or do I want Vegas? I'm gonna pick Vegas and I'll tell you why, because I'm thinking if I'm stalled here, what city's gonna be more fun? What city do I know more people in? But I know the Vegas airport, like the back of my hand, I know that they have a Pee Wee Chinese restaurant. I'm gonna be able to get steamed vegetables and rice. I know that they have a La Solsta. I can get rice and beans. I know that they have a Jamba Juice. I can get smoothies. I can get oatmeal. I, I know that they have a Wendy's. I can get a baked potato. So I pick my travel airports, not my destination, but the connecting flight, obviously the final destination too, because especially if it's cities like Texas or, diff, you know, I pick it based on the food that is going to be available there. And one thing you can do, think about it, the little places that you eat at um, and airports are basically restaurants for the most part. And just like any other restaurant, you can often customize the menu. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But one of the things you can do is, for instance, if there's a juice bar, there's fruits and vegetables. Even if they may not offer them, you can ask to buy them. I've done that. San Francisco is, is a great airport, by the way, especially if you're gonna get stuck because they have a fresh juice bar and they have a yoga room to de-stress and things like that. Get to definitely get to know your air, airports. But the other thing is like, I remember having, um, getting stuck, in, I, I, I wanna say it was Florida in one of the airports and they had a Panda Express. And now Panda Express uses chicken broth. There's a great app. I'm sure you've heard of it called Happy Cow. So everybody that goes anywhere needs to get that app. But they, Panda Express, while the food ostensibly is vegan, they use chicken broth in a lot of their even vegetable stir fries and of course oil. And so what I'll do is obviously if the line is out the door and it's 12 o'clock, no, you're not gonna do this. But if it's an off time, a lot of times these food places in these restaurants, they open early, like nine or 10, and people aren't really eating entrees then. I have said to them, I said, look, I am on a, and again, I always say, and I'm always as respectful as possible, whether it's a restaurant or anywhere, saying, look, I've heard great things about your food, and I don't mean to be difficult, but I'm on a very special diet, and then I say these two words, doctor's orders could you help me? And never when they're busy and they go, well, tell me about your diet. And then I explain, I can't have a single drop of oil. Sometimes I'll say, I use the word allergy because they can relate to that more. 
And but sometimes they say no, but a lot of times if they're not super busy, they will they'll steam me some vegetables over here or something. And then and and when they accommodate me, I am like the most generous tipper you would not believe. You know what I'm saying? So don't ask, don't get. And if you do ask, there's a chance you may get it. But never ask them when they're super busy and the line is out the door. That's why planning in advance. They say, uh, yep. plan, plan to fail. It can be done. Is it difficult? Yes. Do I wish the world was set up differently to make it easier for vegans and healthy vegans in particular? Absolutely. Some cities, Austin has Casa de Luz. Maryland has uh, Green Fair. These are SOS-free restaurants. I don't know any others than that. Oh, another word to the wise. If you can find a restaurant, sometimes, believe it or not, as a healthy vegan, meaning one that avoids at least oil, it's easier to find a compliant meal in a non-vegan restaurant. I wish that wasn't true, but a lot of times in vegan restaurants, they will not accommodate vegans. But you go to steakhouses, you go to Asian type restaurants like poke restaurants. Yes, meat and fish is served, but they're also used to having a lot of sides. So. I've gotten better meals at steakhouses than I have at vegan restaurants because they have vegetables like asparagus and broccoli and all kinds of mm. things, mushroom, and they will steam them. They will roast them. They will make them for me without oil and they'll give me a baked potato the size of a football. And then there's condiments you can get like salsa, for example. Like you, you just have to sometimes think outside the menu. Like you, I'll look at the menu and they'll, okay, so they have fish and it comes with a pineapple salsa. So I'll say, can I, can you give me sides? Things like that. A poke bowl restaurant, or a, I love of this new concept where these restaurants that are doing bowls, they're not vegan, but you can, it, often they have oil-free vegetables, oil-free grains, fruits, so you can customize a bowl or a salad. And I'm telling you, it's delicious. It's, oil is not what makes food delicious, people. You think it is but it's not. And so it's, it's become easier in certain types of restaurants to eat. And remember, a lot of these type of restaurants will exist within airports. You know, think about airports as restaurants and learn to navigate restaurants. Oh, one thing though, you gotta realize, this is a funny story. You're bringing back so many memories of funny stories. I was staying in a hotel and I they had on the menu, French fries and sweet potato fries. And I'm like, oh, this is great. So that means they have sweet potatoes and potatoes. So I'm going to just ask them if they will cook me one. And I don't care if it's microwaved or steamed or baked or whatever. And so I talked to the chef. They go, I can't help you. And I'm thinking, why? He goes, well, because it comes to us frozen. So in other words, the fries already came to them frozen with oil, sh uh, sugar, mm -hmm. and salt. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm trying to make is even though they had it on the menu, they didn't even have sweet potatoes or potatoes on the menu. Oh, one other thing before I forget is, okay, so the refrigerators this is funny i don't know if you ever saw a movie called flight with denzel washington but it's a I really did great not he was nominated for an academy award his performance was so good but he lost unfortunately to daniel day lewis who played president lincoln but man I, this was just a chilling performance he's a pilot who was a drug addict and an alcoholic but there's a scene with a refrigerator in a hotel and it reminded me of this because a lot of times when you go to places whether it's a hotel in Vegas or somewhere else, or even on a cruise ship, there will be a refrigerator there, but that refrigerator is filled with crappy food or water that's $6 a bottle or peanuts that's $10 a can or a $5 thing of Pringles and a $6 Snickers because they want you to be hungry and eat it. And so I have said, you need to take this stuff out of the fridge. I go, oh, we can't. And I said, I'm a food addict. Just if I was an alcoholic, you cannot have alcohol in my room and they will remove it they remove it and guess what when they remove it i got a fridge and that is not and i am not lying that is not a white lie to say i cannot coexist with pringles and snickers because i can't so that's worked in my favor too to do that and they've cleaned out the the, the mini bar for me that is a great tip yeah, yeah one of my pet peeves is when i go to a hotel and there it's usually in some of the fancier hotels and you see there's a fridge so you get all excited like my partner and I, we often like to have some things for sandwiches that we can take on the road and have at lunchtime. So we'll often have a few little sandwich supplies. And then they have these really annoying refrigerators where if you take out the drink and you have it out for more than 10 seconds, it will automatically charge you. Have you seen that? I have not, but that is ridiculous. Yeah, it's extremely frustrating. It happens a lot in Europe, and I don't know whether I've ever experienced it in the North America, but 
they have these little lasers that automatically te detect when you take out a small bottle of wine, let's say. So you have this refrigerator, but you can't use it. It is the most annoying thing. It's a pet peeve of Tell mine. Tell them you're an alcoholic. Tell them they have to. In other countries, I don't know, but I, I, you know, right. I would pay. By the way, if somebody would allow me a refrigerator, I would pay. And because I, you know, here's another interesting thing that, you know, I, because I work with a lot of people who, you, who really struggle with food addiction and they really have to have compliant food. And so some of the things they've done, for example, Whereas maybe they're traveling and it's just too inconvenient to be to bring an instant pot. They have gone to the nearest Walmart and for ten bucks bought a microwave and and used it while they were there and then gifted it to the cleaning person when they left, for right. example. And, and it, sometimes microwaves are available anyway, like in the shared area, especially rest um, mm. hotels, hotels that serve breakfast and they allow you to use it. And that, that, that can be a possibility too, if, if microwave food isn't like the greatest. Oh, there's hot logics too. If you have, if you go by car, there's this really cool thing that like heats up your food in the car using, well, if we have cigarette lighters anymore. But again, if there's a will, there's a way. And if you really mm -hmm. are somebody that wants to stay compliant, that is like you say, traveling either for work or for the experience, not the food, there is a way to do it. If you just get over the fact that not every meal is going to be a five-star meal. Oh, I got to tell you, it, the re a recent trip when we, we moved from the desert to Northern California. So we came up here for a period of a couple of days to, to look to see if we wanted to live here. And we were staying at a very low kind of motel kind of thing. And basically they did have a microwave, but it was like, it was, we got in late. It was like nine o'clock, almost nine and I stopped at Trader Joe's. And I, I travel with this thing. Oh, this, cause see eating vegetables is really important to me. And so I travel with something and it's not very big and it fits in the suitcase. It's very small. It's called the Pamper Chef microwave steamer. And you can steam vegetables in it or other things too, probably. And so I went to Trader Joe's and I got a bag of organic broccoli. They sell white and brown rice organic in these little packages they take three minutes to microwave and I, I didn't really have any seasonings with me so I got I bought some scallions I mean it was delicious I needed calories and it was similar to what I ate at home and I was okay with it but I, I think that just that brings to a whole other subject about food addiction which we could talk about another time why it's so difficult for people to eat plainer simpler food to each his own but if you're somebody that just wants to travel I think you can do it at least for sure in the United States and many countries too. Oh my God, well, Mexico, for me, it's easy in Mexico and I, I'm told for other people too. If you can find fruits and vegetables and have some source of starch, either from rice, beans, or potatoes, either that you bring or buy, I think you're gonna be okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think where there's a will, there's a way. If you really wanna travel and see the world, just don't have very high expectations of food and really focus on the real reasons that you're going, whether it's to relax, whether it's to see a new culture, whether it's to see incredible architecture, to hike in the forest. That's what's really important. The food really is just a the expectation of having amazing food. That really should just be second fiddle, in my opinion. <laughs> well, also, the lower your expectations, the least likely you are to be disappointed. Exactly. Exactly. And then you, may be, you may be pleasantly surprised. I remember one time when I was in, or I think it was called Orcas Island, somewhere in Washington. I don't remember. And and I basically, there are some chefs that are so excited about this way of cooking that when you tell them, like a lot of them are just really annoyed, and they're annoyed even if you're just vegan. But they some will bend over backwards to try to accommodate you, and you mm -hmm. can end up getting something that's not only delicious but better than anybody else in your party that's eating because of mm -hmm. your quote restrictions which to me are not restrictive, but yeah, of course. But yeah. yeah. So, wait, just uh, it's, it's, it's a process. It's going to get easier. It's get, it's gotten easier over the years and it's going to only get easier. So Chef AJ, thank you so much for joining us on the World Vegan Travel Podcast. I know that this content is going to be really helpful for people who really want to travel, but they have certain reasons why they can't eat in every single restaurant. So thank you so much for taking the time to share these tips with our audience here. And I'm sure people are wanting to learn more. So can you share a little bit about how people might find you? Tell a little sure. bit about your books and that live stream. Of course, just if you Google Chef AJ, you'll come up with quite a few things, but every single day, at least for the last two and a half years, I have been live at 11 a.m. Pacific time on YouTube. The channel is my name, Chef AJ, with an interesting guest, and I'll be there talking to you in the chat, welcoming you. And that 
would be really fun to have people watch. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.